In the last video we looked at injecting custom shell codes, so we overflowed the buffer and overwrote the return address with the jump ESP instruction which would jump to our malicious shellcode and we used both the shellcraft library in Pwn Tools and MSF Venom to try out some different shellcode. This time we're going to look at return to libc, so let's go and take a look. We've actually got the exact same code for the secure server. We'll take a look at that in a second. Just to mention we're compiling it this time without the dash z exec stack option. Which means, let's have a look at the file type. File type is still the same here. We've got 32 bits dynamically linked, which is going to be important. And it's not stripped again, so we can see all the function names and things like that. But if we run checksec, we'll see that this time nx has been enabled. So if we try what we tried last time, in fact, I have the old script here. Let's do Python old exploit. So it's exactly the same binary and exactly the same exploit. But if we try to run through that, it's not going to give us that shell. It's not going to print out the flag because the code that we've injected onto the stack is not going to be executed. One other thing to mention here is that you need to make sure that we have the flag.txt is owned by root and the secure server as well should be owned by root and have this sticky bit set. So just make sure you do sudo change owner root root on flag.txt. Do the same thing for the secure server. And then also make sure that sticky bit is set on the secure server. So we'll do sudo chmod 600 on flag.txt and we'll do sudo chmod 4655 on the secure server. Let's have a look at those. In case you get confused about what those permissions are, don't worry, I do as well. Even after spending quite a lot of time with Linux, they still confuse me. Essentially what we have here, so we have our group and we have our owner. And then for our permissions, these are three bits at a time. So you have read, write and execute and that's the others permission and then you have read write and execute as the group permission and read write and execute as the owners permission and these are basically bits so if you think of this as being bits so this equals a 1 this equals a 2 and this equals a 4 so if you had rwx set that would be equal to 7 so 1 plus 2 plus 4 if you only had r and w set then that's just 2 plus 4 so 6 so for example, this one here is 6, 6 again, and then we have all set here, so 7, 7, 6, 6. Hopefully that makes sense, uh, hopefully I didn't get anything wrong there, but don't worry about it, just copy those commands just to make sure you have this owned by root. And let's take a look at our source code, which is the same, but we'll just review it anyway. Okay, so it's exactly the same code as last time. I left in this jump ESP just so that we could show that the old exploit code didn't work. But we don't actually need this anymore because we're not going to be jumping to ESP and expecting code on the stack to execute. But again, we've just got our main method. We're calling receive feedback. We've got a buffer of 64 bytes and a dangerous gets function, which isn't checking to make sure what we enter is going to fit in there. We're going to go over to Geardra and just talk about what our plan of attack is. I took the liberty of opening this up in advance, so let's go over to our functions and have a look at the main. And let's just review the attacks that we've been through so far. So in our first couple of videos, we looked at overwriting variables on the stack, like the authorized variable, which gave us admin access. After that, there weren't any interesting variables on the stack, but there was an interesting function. So we were able to return to our function of interest by using that return to win style attack. And then after that we looked at the same attack again but the return to win function actually took in some parameters and we needed to make sure those parameters were correct in order to get through to our hacked function. We then injected custom shellcode onto the stack because we weren't able to do any of this stuff. There was no interesting function to return to. There was no local variables worth overwriting to give us admin access. So we injected our own code to print the flag or to get a shell. This time around we don't have any of this stuff. We can't inject shellcode. We don't have any interesting functions to return to and we've got no interesting variables to overwrite. So this is where we want to look into returning to libc. So as we mentioned a couple of times whenever we checked the file type of the binary, we have this dynamically linked set which means that the functions that are called from libc, for example gets and puts, rather than including all of the code in the binary, that code is stored in your libc library on your system. And whenever this, whenever the 
program wants to access one of those functions, let's go and have a look at the global offset table here. Basically what's going to happen is whenever it calls, for example, gets, it's going to go to this global offset table section and it's going to look to see, do we know what address the gets function is in the libc library on this computer? Because every version of libc is going to have different functions with different amounts of code. So the offsets will always be different. And sometimes you'll have protections like ASLR on there, which will actually randomize the address. So it'll go and find out what the address is and it'll return and it'll populate the global offset table with that address so that the next time it's called, it won't need to go and find out what that address is. It'll just use what it's populated in the global offset table. So that potentially means that what we can do is we can return to functions that are in libc. libc has gets and puts and printf and things like that. But it also has very useful functions like system and strings like bin sh. So if we were able to access some of those functions in libc, even though there's nothing interesting in this program and we can't inject our own shell code, we can potentially return to the libc library and then start executing functions in there. And in doing that, we can hopefully get a shell. Let's go and take a look with gdb pwn debug and see where the offset to the instruction pointer is. So we're going to do cyclic 100. Let's take a copy of that again. We'll run the program. Paste it in. It's probably going to be the same as last time because it's the same code. Let's check cyclic l. Uh, 76. All right. So 76 bytes. And then we're going to overwrite the instruction pointer with the address of hopefully with the libc system library. And the parameter we want to pass, not library, sorry, the function within the library. And the parameter we want to pass to system is going to be slash bin slash sh. So we will be able to do that. In fact, inside pwn debug, let's see, I think we can do search for a string. Search dash t string. Let's see if we can search for it. Bin sh. Okay, so we've actually found it in our libc library. Um, and that's where it is when it's running. Let's. I'm going to exit this, and I'm going to show how we can, how we would normally do this, if I was doing it on a local system. So if we're doing this on a remote system, things get a bit more complex, and we'll go through that in future videos. But for now, what we'll do is LDD secure server, and this is the address of our libc library. Now the only thing is, if we do that again, each time we run that, it's got a different address. And that was that ASLR that I mentioned, address space layout randomization, where basically binaries will have a random address to prevent buffer overflow attacks. So we can actually disable that. I've got a, an alias set up to do that. Let's, let me grep out ASLR from my bash aliases. This just makes it so you don't have to type out the full command each time. So this is the command, echo zero, and we're echoing it at this randomized VA space. That'll turn it off. I'm just going to type the command because I have that set up. It set it to zero, and now if we do that again, every time it's got the same base address. So this is the base of the libc library. So the next thing is going to be to find out where is system, and we can do that as well. Let's. I'm going to use read elf s, and then we'll pass in this libc library and we're going to grep out a function that we're interested in. So we'll grep out system. And now we know what the offset is from the base of libc to system. So if, for example, we had leaked one of these addresses, let's say this was a remote server. Obviously a remote server, I can't just go and grep out system from their libc library. But if I was able to leak it somehow, and there's a few techniques to do that, which we'll talk about in future videos. If I was able to leak, say, gets or puts, what I would do is I would go and grep out just obviously in a local system I'm talking about here, we would say grep outputs and see, okay, how far is puts from the base of the binary? And then if we subtract this from the address that we've leaked, we now have the address of the base of the binary. And that means we can add the address or the offset of system to that base address, and we now have the address of system. Or we can add the offset of puts to that to get the address of puts, etc. Hopefully that makes sense. Don't, don't know if I explained that very well, but let's just say that we always want to try and find our way back to the base of the libc library, and then we can find our offsets very easily to other functions from there. Let's do the same for the bin sh string. So we've got our libc library here. I'm going to use 
strings dash a dash t x to represent it as hex. I'm going to paste in that libc library address and I'm going to grep out bin slash sh because if we know if we pass this to system it's going to call bin sh. And there we have the offset of that string. So we've built up everything we need to. What I'm going to do is open up the exploit, the new exploit, and let's take a look at it. We've got all the usual stuff here at the beginning, just setting up the template. And you can see here I've put in some of the addresses. Let's go and see if these line up. We've got our libc base address was here, so I'll take a copy of that. It is the same. We've got our system, so system was libc base plus this offset looks the same as well and our bin sh string unless you live C library update so you've got ASLR on these should all be the same anyway the offsets will always be the same unless you've updated the libc library or something okay and then bin sh that was the same there as well so we've got all of our addresses we're gonna do our buffer overflow we're gonna write 76 bytes of a's or whatever we want here it doesn't need to be no operation instructions this time because we're not doing shell code and then we want to call system, which was the libc base plus that offset. We want to just put something in the return pointer just to pad that out. And then the next thing on the stack is bin sh as a string. Remember, 32-bit will take its parameters off the stack and 64-bit will take it out of the registers, the RDI, RSI, RDX. And then we write the payload to a file. We're going to send that off and we're going to get into, hopefully get into a shell. So let's save that, let's run the binary, run the exploit, sorry. And you see straight away we've got into interactive mode, I can say who am I, I'm root, so I can also say cat flag.txt, and we get back the flag. One other thing, let me just, because let's have a look at that with GDB. So if you're ever having problems doing this against a remote server, or you're leaking addresses and things aren't working, you might want to go in here and just see if you can actually confirm those addresses so oh, okay that wasn't a good example because I didn't print the addresses so let's just add some print statements and we'll say info let's say our system address is equal to percentage hash x and then we'll pass in the system address we'll do the same thing for bin sh So we run that with GDB. Just going to hit Control and C here so we get access to this screen where we can actually type stuff. And we can see that we've got our leaked addresses. They weren't leaked really because we manually hard coded the base address. But let's assume this was a slightly harder challenge and we'd leaked these addresses. We could then go into GDB and do X, print that address, and see that does equal system, which is awesome. Now, if we wanted to find the base of the binary, we could subtract the offset and see does it actually make it back. So I could say print out system minus and then what was our offset of system? Let me take a copy of that. And this is actually the base of the binary. Let me try and print that as a string. All right, so you can see here the elf. So you can see that that's the correct address anyway. So things are lining up. And again, we might want to do the same thing for our bin sh, where is it? Let's take a copy, we'll print that, if we print it as hex, we'll see here it's actually showed it there as bin sh because it was a pointer. Okay, not really too important in this case, I just want to get, get everybody used to using GDB to debug these when it is necessary and just show the fact that we can quite easily swap between debugging local and remote using this template. All right, and that generates a payload file. So with that, we could hopefully just run secure server, send in that payload, and we can't actually do that. It didn't work. Okay, uh, that's fine. Let me try that again. Python exploit. It might not have saved the payload there. So here we are, root, and let's try that again. Secure server, payload, segmentation fault. Okay, uh, let's instead try, let me do cat payload, cat, and then let's pipe that to secure server. Okay, it's allowing us to type commands, it's not bringing back the output. Let me do that again, but this time with a dash p at the end. 
and that still doesn't work. Let me try again. Oh, it does work. Okay, I guess it just doesn't take the first command there. Alright, well, yeah, you can do that. Basically, because it's an interactive prompt, we can't just send off the payload because it'll send back the response, but obviously we want to interact with it. We want to send it commands, so instead you can use this format. But it does work manually. Okay, I think that's it for the 32-bit. Let's go and check out the 64-bit. And this is exactly the same this time around, so we've got our secure server, it's 64-bit this time. And it's dynamically linked, which is important because obviously we're going to be returning to the libc library to execute functions there. And of course the protection is also enabled here, the stack protections, so we can't execute code on the stack. So what's going to be different here? Well, we know that parameters are provided differently, we need to pop RDI. So we would need to find that with ropper. We'd need to do ropper dash dash file, pass in secure server, and then we can just look for the RDI, or we can search for it, dash dash search, pop RDI. We get that address, and this is what we're going to need to pop the bin sh string into the RDI register, so that when the system function is called, it looks in the RDI for that string. 32-bit, remember, will look on the stack, and 64-bit will look in these registers. So I'm just going to go ahead and open up the exploit straight away. We'll scroll through here, we'll see that we've got our longer address here, so actually I should have done that as well. Let's do LDD secure server. So this is now the 64-bit library instead, and we've obviously got a different address for it. So you need to update that address and also the addresses of the functions. I found these just in the same way, using read elf and using strings. So I'll not go through that again. We've got our pop RDI gadget. This time there's 72 bytes of padding, so it was 76 last time. And we write that padding, we use pop RDI to pop the next value on the stack into the RDI register. And then we call system with that in place and it will execute that for us. We write it as a file to a payload again so that we can reuse it later. And let's just try it out. We run that, we get our shell. We can say, who am I? We can compare the differences with what's being sent and received here. And we are also root. There's a couple of cool things we can do here. I'll actually just show... Let me go to one of my previous CTF challenges. The library. So this is a return to libc challenge. You can see I did a few different scripts for it. And I just want to have a look because I think... I actually imported the libc library, yeah. So you can see here, we can actually import our libc library instead. Let me go back here and do this instead. We'll do libc is equal to this binary. And then you can see that instead of specifying all of those offsets, we actually just find that quite automatically. So let me take a copy of this. You can see that to find our system address, we simply just call libc.symbols or libc.functions.system. And then we're also just going to search using this next function to search for the bin sh string in there. Which means what I'm going to do is simply replace the system function, which we manually specified earlier. I'm just going to replace that with libc.symbols.system. And then the bin sh I'm going to replace with this next search. Let's take that out of there. Let's take out this payload as well. Let's save that and try it again. Oh, we got an end of file. Let me do LDD. Secure server. just want to see if this is correct. So we have that there. We might need to specify, because we didn't leak the address, we might need to still specify the base address. Let me grab that address. And what we can do here then, so we've got libc, I'm going to say libc.address. And this will actually set the base address. And hopefully that's all it was looking for. Let's have a look. We run that again, and this time we get our shell. I'll just show very quickly as well the ropstar script. So normally I show a ropstar script where we do things really automatically. And in this case, you can go and take a look at this. We'll go through some of these examples in future videos as well. But we're essentially using that ROP library that we used in some previous videos against the libc library. So that we can literally just call ROP.system 
and pass in that bin s8 string. One final thing I want to quickly mention is the one gadget tool. So I'm going to open up this link. Let's take a look at this. So when playing CTF Pwn Challenges, we usually need a one gadget RCE, remote code execution, which leads to call bin sh. This gem provides such gadgets finder, no need to use object dump or IDA Pro every time. And we can install it with gem, gem install one gadget. And then we can just run one gadget against the libc library to see what gadgets we have available. So you can see there's a blog here, you can go and check that out if you want to read more about how this works. But let's go and see if we can quickly demonstrate this as well. So it's argued that this could be quite useful in terms of overwriting elements of the global offset table. So we're going to look at this in a future video, overwriting an element of the global offset table with the system function in the libc library and then call in bin sh. But if we weren't able to call bin sh after overwriting the global offset table address with system, this would be another option because you only need one address here then to get a shell. Hopefully that makes sense. Let's go and take a quick look at it. As an example of how this works, let's do LDD secure server. Let's find our libc library. And then we'll use one gadget, provide the address to the libc library. And this gives us a few different offsets. So if we can call libc plus this offset, just like we do whenever we've found the libc base address and we add the offset of system, or we add the offset of bin sh, this time we're going to add this as an offset and this is enough just to get a shell straight away. But it has these constraints, the R12 and the R13 register must be null, otherwise this won't work. So we could try this one. If it doesn't work, we can try this one. But in this one we need R12 and R RDX to be null. And if that doesn't work, we can try the third one where we need RSI and RDX to be null. So as an example of how that would work, let's go back to our return to libc attack. Remember we've got our libc base address set here. So rather than doing this return to libc where we pop the bin sh string into the RDI and we call libc symbols.system, instead we'll literally do libc, let's do the libc base address plus and then that offset. And this is just going to directly call bin sh. So we can try and run that. Let me open another terminal so I can keep that open. You can see that doesn't work for me. So we could go ahead and just straight away try the next one. Just literally update that offset, run it again. Still don't get a shell. All right, let's try the third and final option. You can do this on 32-bit as well. And it just depends what version of libc uh, as to what offsets you're going to get here and what the constraints are going to be. Let's run that again. Third one doesn't work either. So what we probably want to do here then is open up GDB, pwn debug, provide the secure server, and let's... Let's have a look, info functions, let's disassemble that receive feedback. Let's grab the return address here. This is where, this is where we're going to overflow the buffer. So this is the return address where our payload is going to be. So take that, let's go back to our script and we'll add a breakpoint here. We'll say break at that address, save that. Let's go back to our first example. So we needed R12 and R13 to be null. So we'll take a copy of that. We'll write that there. And I'm going to do Python exploit GDB. And this time we're going to hit a breakpoint. You can see we've hit that breakpoint. I'm going to hit Control and C so I can see the output. And we're basically just going to go and have a look in here and see what's in those registers at the time. So we needed R12 and R13 to be null and they aren't you can see here that we've got a value in the R12. So that's not going to work. We need to try and find a gadget. We need to use ropper dash dash file secure server and we need to go and have a look to see if we can clear that R12 register. So for example we could use this gadget. We could pop a null value into all of these registers. But it's a little bit overkill. I mean quite often when I use that one gadget tool you don't even need to change any parameters any of the registers in order to make it work but you can do that check out all three of them and see where the problems are but all three of those those options that we had the constraints weren't met so as I say we would need to in our script we need to go and find something to say we need to pop um, in that case it was R12 and then we'll just put some null value in there 
Uh, just a quick demonstration of that. Maybe we'll return to this whenever we get to the global offset table video. And it's just uh, that's another one worth bearing in mind. Okay, so in this video we've looked at how we can return to libc or return to system. So we're returning to the libc library, more specifically we're returning to the system function in the libc library. But we didn't do that in a way that we'll be able to easily recreate on servers. So we're going to need to work out how we can leak addresses. And that's what's coming up in the next video. We're going to look at format string vulnerabilities and they tie in very nicely with buffer overflows and help us bypass a lot of other mitigations which we'll see in the challenges following that. But I hope you've enjoyed this video anyway. If you have any questions or comment, leave them down below. Thanks.